Gravity. It's a big bone of contention with the science and I and globe deniers, and they can't seem to get any of it right. That's what we're going to talk about today. Roll the intro. So, let's start with the first one. Does Einsteinian uh, general relativity supersede Newtonian's law, the Newtonian law of gravitation? Uh, does Einstein beat Newton? Let's take a look at this. On the electrodynamics of moving bodies, it's where Einstein first introduced uh, the theory of special relativity. You'll notice it starts out with, let us have a coordinate system for which the Newtonian equations hold. Think about that for a second. Hold on to that. Then we have general relativity, section one. The special relativity theory rests on the following postulate which holds valid for the Galileo-Newtonian mechanics. So both special relativity and general relativity start right out telling you that they are based on Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian frames of reference. There is, there is no doubt about that. This is section 14 of general relativity. Uh, gravitation, here we go. And at the end of section 14, it will be shown that the equations arising from pure mathematical way out of the conditions of general relativity, together with equations 46, give us the Newtonian law of attraction as the first approximation, and led in the second approximation to the explanation of the perihelion motion of Mercury, discovered a lot by Le Verrier. I hope I said that right the residual effect which could not be accounted for by consideration of all sorts of disturbing factors. My view is that these are convincing proofs of the physical correctness of my theory. He is flat out telling you that the fact that general relativity agrees with Newtonian gravitational gravitation is proof of the correctness of the theory of general relativity flat out saying it right there. Oh, and wait. If that wasn't enough, then we move on to section 21 of general relativity. Newton's theory is a first approximation, and he goes on to further discuss how his theory of general relativity agrees with Newtonian theory of gravitation. So, it's clear throughout all of this that Einstein is showing that Newton's theory of gravitation is highly important to general relativity. It's based on uh, Newtonian mechanics. It's based on everything that Newton has already set down. And as a proof of the correctness of general relativity, he shows that it agrees with Newtonian gravitation. If you need any further proof of Einstein's belief in Newtonian gravitation, uh, here's a quote, actually two quotes from, from Einstein. In the beginning, if there was such a thing, God create, created Newton's laws of motion together with the necessary masses and forces. This is all. Everything beyond this follows from the development of the appropriate mathematical methods by means of deduction. In other words, Newton's laws are all there is, and everything else that we learn comes off of that. And then he says, and that was in 1946, this is in 1919, no one must think that Newton's great creation can be overthrown in any real sense by this, the theory of relativity, or by any other theory. 
his clear and wide ideas forever retain the significance as the foundation of our modern conception of physics have been built. On which our modern conception of physics have been built. Everything rests upon Newton's great creation, Newton's laws of motion, Newtonian gravitation. All rests upon that. Even though Newton himself knew he did not know what gravity was, and he did not know the cause. Uh, at the very end of uh, nat uh, mathematical principles of natural philosophy, he even talks about it. Newton talks about how he has no idea how gravity works. All he knows is that he, we can predict its outcome we can determine its effects these are immeasurable and quantifiable phenomena what the actual cause is nobody knows and he likens it to a spirit he likens it to a ghost so as you can see um einstein clearly shows you he doesn't supersede newton not only in, in quotes subsequent to, to general relativity where he says that it will never be superseded. As it showed in section 14 of general relativity, and, and if any of you science denying globe deniers actually read general relativity, may have skimmed it and said, I don't get it, I'm not going to read any further. But if you had, you'd know that not only in section 14, but several other sections, he shows where his theory agrees with Newton. And in section 14 actually says the fact that it agrees with Newtonian gravitation, he believes to be sufficient evidence of the correctness of his theory. He actually says that in general relativity. But why? Why did he say that? Why is it that he had to show general relativity agrees with Newtonian gravitation? The reason is because then, just as now, nobody thinks Newtonian gravitation is wrong. It was always considered to be correct. It was considered to be incomplete, but it was always correct. Even Newton considered it to be incomplete. At the end of book three of the uh, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, Newton tells you, I have no idea what gravity is. I have no idea what causes it. And it was a bone of contention for him. It was a problem for him that he was unable to find the cause. He likened it to a spirit, a ghost. You know, it was elusive. He couldn't figure it out. Then comes along Einstein, and general relativity, and now we know that that acceleration, that no one can figure out where it comes from, is the due to the curvature of space-time. One of the best descriptions I've heard, uh, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say, and I don't know if, he, if he's the originator of it, but gravity tells space how to curve. That curvature of space-time tells objects how to move. So mass curves space, that curvature causes objects to move. So if curvature of space-time is where the acceleration comes from, and let's get this part straight. Newton never quantifies gravity as a force. Nobody ever quantifies gravity as a force. It's always an acceleration. 9.81 meters per second squared, 9.82, someplace in there, because it varies depending on where you are on the Earth. If, so that point where you science denying globe deniers want to say, well, it's the curvature of the space-time, so therefore it's not a force, Therefore, Newtonian gravitation goes away. Well, Newton doesn't quantify as a force, does he? He quantifies it as an acceleration, which is exactly what you get 
when you do the integrations of Einstein's field equations to get Newtonian gravitation, guess what? Well, so to say that, and I've heard many science that I and Globe I say this, you need gravity to be a force. If it's not a force, then it doesn't exist. Well, no, I don't need it to be a force because I know it's not a force. It's an acceleration that gives me a force. And really the only people who care about the source of gravity, the curvature of space-time or whatever else may be the actual physical cause, the only people who care about that are really physicists and science that I englobe that others. Me, I'm a mechanical engineer, a very practical numbers, facts kind of guy. When I do a stress analysis on a piping system on board a ship at sea, all I care about is the forces involved in that piping system due to its own weight and due to you know thermal expansion all kinds of stuff so it's supported by pipe hangers it's supported by anchors and it has its own weight well the force of that weight is its mass let's say it's a thousand kilograms times the acceleration of gravity that gives me uh if it's a thousand kilograms that gives me uh 9,800 newtons of force that I have to account for somewhere in all of those supports and in the pipe itself because we don't want the pipe to bend and break like a paperclip. So you have to understand that that mass has, exerts a force and that force is due to the acceleration of gravity. So we have the non sequitur of uh, trying to get rid of Newtonian gravitation with Einsteinian relativity and then discrediting relativity by saying mathematical construct, therefore it all goes away, gravity doesn't exist. You can't, you can't make that argument. You can say it. You can say it all you want, and all of you do. I mean, Anthony Riley and, and um, Nathan Oakley, I think mean, that's your your favorite thing to say newton is superseded therefore gravity is not a force although he quantifies gravity as an acceleration and then it's superseded by einstein but mathematical construct thought experiment no one's ever proven it it goes away and oh by the way no one's ever proven it and here's the last part of this video Gravity is literally the most studied subject in the history of physics. The most studied subject. It's a matter of scientific consensus that is backed and supported by volumes, tens of millions of pages of peer-reviewed published papers and data. And before one of you science denying globe deniers go, scientific consensus, that's appeal to authority, logical fallacy. No, it is not. Learn how logical fallacies work. Because just like many other logical fallacies, appeal to authority has an exception. And scientific consensus is one of those conce conceptions. Uh, I'm sorry, exceptions. Uh, so don't even go there. That's just wrong and a misapplication. It's a, it's basically another straw man argument to hide the fact that you know you you can't get away from from uh, scientific consensus. But I'm going to show you a paper. Now this paper is a summary of the tests of gravitational theory, mostly of you know general relativity. It provides you the a basic summary of the test, the analytical solution of the test, and the source for the peer-reviewed source for that test. I could give you volumes, volumes of peer-reviewed data. And what do you guys got? You can't even figure out how relative disequilibrium results in a constant uh, acceleration regardless of the value of disequilibrium. And here's the other thing that you guys, well, we'll get to that in a second. Let's see this paper real quick. 
Experimental Tests of Gravitational Theory. This paper summarizes uh, some of the more important tests of basically general relativity. Uh, gives you a brief description of each of the tests, including the citation to the original peer-reviewed published data for the tests. They're all here. Well, not all, but some of the more significant ones are here. If anyone wants to see it, I will link this in the description. But here at the end are all of the papers that are referenced in this document. Gravity is the most studied subject in the history of physics, and it is supported by plenty of testable, verifiable data and peer-reviewed published papers of tests and experiments proving the validity of Newtonian gravitation and uh, general relativity. So all of you science denying, globe deniers can suck it. It has been tested and it has been proven over and over. It has passed every test so far, so deal with it. Okay, so as you can see, that is a, a great source of information uh, of peer-reviewed papers in, uh, for the tests and experiments of gravitational theory. So until you can refute that by, you know, your own science, which, do you guys even have any science? Well, there's no science for a flat earth. Thanks, Riley. Until you can refute any of that, you got, you've got, don't have a leg to stand on. Because all you're going to do is go, nah, uh because reasons and say none of what you've shown is invalid, uh, some hand-waving nonsense about peer-reviewed papers aren't valid. Like I said, the most studied subject in the history of physics. Let's get back to one more thing associated with your relative density disequilibrium. So if any science that I and globe deniers decide that they want to answer this video, I want you to sh tell me if I have an object of two objects, actually, each made of a different material, one of steel, one of magnesium. So I have a different relative density disequilibrium between them. Why is it when I drop them from a very high height, let's say I drop them from 4,000 meters, why is the downward acceleration for both of them identical, even though they have different relative density disequilibriums with the medium? in this case, the atmosphere. And then you have to answer this second question. What is terminal velocity? Because here's the thing. From 4,000 meters down to the sea level, the farther down in the atmosphere gets, the density of the atmosphere increases, terminal velocity decreases. That's right the actual density of the atmosphere is increasing drag on the object, causing the terminal velocity to go down as the density increases. So you have a situation where you're claiming the relative density disequilibrium causes the object to fall, and that same medium that causes the object to fall also provides a force in the opposite direction slowing down the fall. Can you explain those two things? I think not. I'm Mike the Engineer, and I'm out. Talk to you guys next time.